Hey, it's Kyle here, and KSP2's major four signs update is finally out, and... Wait, what, that was December? Yeah, look, uh, I kinda got a little disenfranchised with KSP2 after that update, and stopped making this video halfway through in December. Unfortunately, my brain wouldn't let me move on to another video project or game until I followed through and finished this one off first. So, I've been stuck in creative purgatory until now. This is the worst! <laughs> Throwing a bout of COVID, changing jobs and travelling across Australia for work, and this video very quickly fell through the cracks. So, let's pick up back where we left off. Joule, the biggest planetary body in the Kerbal system, a green, glistening orb in the night sky, and the protector of the inner Kerbin system from hostile meteors and other space-born debris. Kerbin scientists have long theorised that this gas giant is in fact something much more. They believe it has a solid surface that could be landed on. So that's what we're doing this time, trying to land on Jules' surface. I will stress the trying part of this. But is this even possible in KSP2 version 0.2? Well, unfortunately, KSP2 is still quite a bit of a mess. So we're going to have to do this as a scientific endeavor and not an engineering one. Even though we will build a craft suitable for traveling from Kerman to Jewel, due to the game's current state, we will be abusing the administrative tools and the cheat menu to allow us to accomplish this task. Don't get me wrong, KSP2 has come a long way since launch, but there are some niggling issues that need to be resolved, especially with docking adapters, for it to be as good as the original it's based on. So, with that preamble out the way, let's get started. So, first things first, I built an SSTO-style craft, teleported it to a low dual orbit, and set about testing if what I was hoping to attempt was even possible. Now, keep in mind, this was in December 2023, just after the Force Science update had landed, and at this point, we weren't sure how the new aerodynamic and heating systems were going to impact actually getting into dual, and whether it was still possible. The first thing I noticed is that Time Warp still does weird things with aerodynamics, which left my SSTO rolling to the right following an incident. Even after jettisoning our support tanker, the problem persisted. Eventually, we got nice and close to the cloud covers for having to do a desperate pull-up maneuver as the craft started disintegrating, along with a quick revert to VAB to save Val. The takeaways were kind of expected. Firstly, now that the thermal system and re-entry heating is properly implemented in the game, it doesn't look like we can get down to the cloud layer anymore. Do you get to the cloud district very often? Oh, what am I saying? Of course you don't. At least not in a standard manner. At an altitude of 12,500 kilometers, massive re-entry forces are applied to the craft, even when traveling at slower velocities. In our case, we were traveling below 200 meters a second horizontally, with a fall rate below 10 meters a second, and even when we leveled out, the damage continued. Out of curiosity, I decided to use the cheat menu to cheese it. You know, for science. Yes, yeah, science! And teleported to dual surface. What followed was instant destruction. However, some parts survived. So, I think you know what this means. Can we make something that could survive on Jules' surface? The parts that survived were a bit varied, from the cockpit to the engines and some wings, so let's see what we can do with a sample craft which has high impact tolerance and high temperature resistance. And after a failed attempt, and another, and another, and another, it seems like the old bug of landing on Jules' surface has indeed been patched. Or has it? It's a cunning plan, actually. Of course it is. While the surface gravity is a whopping 300 times Kerbin's gravity, it's not what is killing the crafts. Initially, I thought the issue would be to do with the impact tolerances, but based on testing, it's the overheating mechanics. And it might not just be where they land, it might also be to do with how the game handles it. So, now we have our mission and some parameters. Build a landing craft which can stand the heat of Jewel and see how far down we can make it. But just one landing craft is not enough, so I've built us a whole menu of burgers to test. Wow! First up, we have the Super Jewel Burger with a trio of Separatron stages, reaction wheel, and an antenna, all inside an extra large HS500 bun and served with a side of toasty grid fins. Next up is the Jewel Royale, which brings the heat with four spicy Separatron stages, a slice of reaction wheel, and an antenna sandwiched between two HS375s, also served with a side of toasty grid fins. 
these two big bergs are pretty well insulated with their probe core patties being their lowest point of thermal resistance at 800k. Still pretty good for a probe core. Let's move down to the smaller offerings. On a freshly toasted H250 bun, we have the dual Chesburger. With only two stages of separatrons and an antenna, this little guy can take the heat up to 800k, but it has one less possible point of failure, no reaction wheel. Moving on to dessert, we have the dual cone with its three separatron stages, all smothered in our patented six-sided fluffy heat cone. This will let us see if ice cream really can cool the heat of dual, well, inflated heat shields at least. And last of all, we have the Jewel Nugget, a bite-sized meal with three Separatron stages and a tasty fairing coating rated up to 1600K. Will it make any difference for its tasty interior? Probably not, but we need to know. Now, all jokes aside, it's worth mentioning we're not using any additional batteries on these probes as they have a lower critical temperature, around 600K, and we want to avoid explosive disassembly for as long as possible. This does mean that we'll be turning on unlimited electricity. We've seen that the heat starts to increase around the 12,500 kilometer mark with most of the basic parts failing around the 12,000 kilometer mark. So that's the minimum survival line we need to pass. But if you've been playing Kerbal for a while, you might know that there's one more part we can use that has an insane temperature tolerance, a 1500 Kelvin, and that is the Mark III cockpit. For some reason, all aircraft parts have a higher heat tolerance than the lander can, so why not use them? After all, why not? So behold, this is the Jewel Shake. Tall, thirst quenching, and the craft most likely to be able to take the heat of the gas giant. In fact, the engines and docking port will hit critical temperature long before the cockpit or its fuel supplies do. And even then, it's only 200 degrees before the heat shield fails anyway. Now, I know what you're thinking. It's a bit cruel to send a Kerbal to their death. Then we've actually already lost Bill and Bob due to the game refusing to revert test flights and spiriting them away. But this is for science, and as such, we've ticked all the boxes for ethics, signed all the waivers, and thankfully, we have a willing participant. Everyone, meet Will. That's illegal. It's not illegal. Will says he'll do whatever is asked of him, and in this case, that's quite a lot. So without further ado, it is time to make our mothership and get to Jewel. there we have it, our Jewel Uber is ready, complete with all our burger themed pods and sides. Yes, I have skipped over this because we're not going to spend a lot of time talking about the craft, because we can't actually use it properly. I spent hours trying to assemble this thing in orbit before eventually giving up, the parts either refused to stay connected, or when you were about to dock, the Kraken 2 would cause the parts to fly away from each other at accelerating speeds. This is where I gave up my original attempt in December, and it looks like I might have deleted the footage when cleaning up my OBS folder. So let's take the easy way out this time. We've arrived in low dual orbit. First up, the Super Jewel Burger. Don't worry about that low power warning, we have unlimited power turned on. We've separated from the ship, and after a quick parts test, it's time to fire up our Separaton engines and head down into the clouds of Jewel. We used all three stages to reduce our speed by as much as possible, as I kind of suspected at this point the horizontal speed of our SSTO was partly to blame for our previous explosive encounter, if you will. KSP2 seems to struggle with deciding how it handles both heating and aerodynamic forces sometimes, and this becomes a bit more clear when you load a save which was made in a hazardous environment such as the clouds of Jewel or on Jewel's surface. Sometimes foreshadowing is relatively obvious. But this time, as we pass through Jewel's cloud layer, I'm not seeing the heat hazards our SSTO saw around the 12,000 kilometer mark, which suggests it could be more to do with the horizontal speed or the game engine. We have no heat warnings on our craft, so we're good. And we can see the dark surface of Jewel coming closer from below, but we're traveling way too fast at almost 50 meters a second. Ideally, you want to touch down at under 5 meters a second for a smooth landing and not to overstress any of your parts. 
So we've crashed into the surface, but what is surprising is we actually made it the whole way down on our first attempt. Right, let's try out our next probe, the Jewel Royale. This is a tasty burger. This time around, the probe took forever to enter the atmosphere, resulting in needing to use our extra set of separatons, this one had four instead of three, which I had planned to help us slow down for landing. This is another reason I have issues with the state of KSP-2. The previous entry was pretty straightforward, and this time I gained altitude in some locations despite having a smaller lifting area. These are two very similar crafts entering a planet's atmosphere at the same rate and having completely different experiences. These inconsistencies are a big issue to me, and it makes me feel like every mission is down to luck. While aerodynamics could possibly account for this behavior, it doesn't explain why they didn't impact the Super Jewel Burger, but did impact the Jewel Royale, despite having almost identical shapes and parts. So in this case, I was gaining too much altitude and I was actually heading out of Jewel. Though even that was hard to be sure of, seeing as the trajectory lines had, again, disappeared. Eventually, we got into the clouds, but I wasn't expecting much joy seeing as our only chances of survival, a suicide burn at the surface, was ruined by the errant aerodynamics of Jewel, which made me use that extra set of thrusters. And once we got down to around 4km, we got caught in what I can only assume is an updraft and just kept spinning around and I gave up. But I couldn't leave the Royale while it was considered active. Yep, so I had to destroy it. So, so far it hasn't seemed like raw heat was the issue for re-entry, but more speed. The Super Jewel Burger was travelling slower than the Royale when it entered the atmosphere, if only marginally, and at a much steeper entry angle. So what about our little Chez Burger? It has no reaction wheel to fail, using the probe's inbuilt core thanks to its smaller size and weight. And if we survived, could we use the last four separatons to aim for a soft landing? Firstly, things went a lot smoother on re-entry, suggesting a lower horizontal speed is definitely better. We made it into the clouds, spotted the surface, but unfortunately, I triggered the burn a bit too late. Uh, next time I tried to load the dual Uber, well, the, uh, the splash screen wouldn't unload, so I had to force quit the game. Last quick save was during re-entry, so let's give it another shot. And it's gone. Uh, suddenly we have heating pressures again? Sure. Okay, then uh, let's move on to the Jewel Nugget. Alrighty then. Okay, let's try something different. It's time for dessert with the Jewel Cone. Can soft serve and a fluffy insulated shield reduce our heat, slow us down, and maybe even cushion our landing? Let's find out. Now, the extending heat shield was causing a lot of drag in the upper atmosphere, so I collapsed it until we reached the mid-atmosphere, the second blue bar up on the atmosphere gauge, located on the bottom right of the nav ball. The last thing I wanted was to get caught in another round of aerial acrobatics. Unfortunately, the descent took a lot longer than I expected, so much so that it was now night time on Jewel. Additionally, the expanding heat shield made it very difficult to control the craft, stopping me from orienting myself to use the landing thrusters, even with a reaction wheel. Even though we hit the ground at only 25 meters a second, it was not enough to stop the entire craft breaking apart. This leaves us with one last attempt, and the most dangerous of them all. It's time to send down the dual shake and our willing participant. Now, poor Will is losing his mind, unfortunately, and after having seen our previous five-ish attempts, I can't blame him, but he does have quite a few things in his favour. The Mark III space plane part is one of the most heat-resistant parts in the game, and it's pretty sturdy as well. He also has a parachute system, and while I honestly hadn't expect that to survive re-entry, we've determined that heating's not the problem, so fingers crossed. Also, remember how I thought the landing burn for the Chesburger was triggered too late? Yeah, it wasn't. It's because of how crazy Jules' gravity is at over 300 times that of Kerbin. While they're not exactly powerful, even with all four of the engines firing at full blast, I couldn't even shave off an extra 0.1 of a meter a second during descent. Weirdly though, this time, things just worked out. We managed to touch down at a little over 9.5 meters a second, so now that we're here, why not try a little spacewalk? Uh-oh. He's gone. Well, it looks like Kerbals can't survive in Jules 
atmosphere. You know, green and green, I thought we might work. Anyway, roll the credits. That's where we're gonna leave it this time around. We achieved our goal and landed on the surface of Jewel and sometimes sacrifices have to be made. Thanks so much to everyone that stuck around while I've been absent. I had to get myself back into video creation mode in the last 12 months have really hampered that. Hopefully things will be a bit smoother sailing from here on, but we'll have to see. While I want to love KSP2, I think I'm just going to leave it alone for a while now until it's not a roll of the dice every time I plan a mission. I realize some other Kerbal YouTubers are having much more luck with it than I am, but I don't really want to spend my limited spare time fighting the bugs in a game at the moment. Going forward, I am going to be diversifying the channel content. Kerbal Space Program 1 will still continue to be the backbone of this channel, but I'm going to start making videos in Space Engineers and a few other sci-fi and space games to keep things a little bit more varied and interesting. This is also to ensure I don't mentally roadblock myself again or burn out by trying to make content that is way too time consuming. Career Strategia and the Artemis program will continue to be high value videos requiring a lot of editing and I'll throw in some other let's plays as well to kind of keep things a little bit more interesting. I'm also looking at checking out No Man's Sky as it's apparently an exceptional game now and a few other games in my Steam back catalogue for solo videos or series but we'll see how we go with Space Engineers first. Starfield, I literally haven't touched that since the live stream I did which for me is a pretty bad sign. Either way, fingers crossed I'll be putting out videos semi-regularly going forward, but I guess time will tell. But enough of all that, thank you so much for watching, and I'll catch you on the next pass.